the closing the deal and so on. So I think that was that was great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, MC. And I think for Tuff, because he has invested in uh, MedIQ, and I think other startups also like to know, you know, uh, what is one thing that stands out for investors? So when MedIQ came to you and they pitched uh, to you, what was one thing that stood out for you to make that investment in, in their company? Well, you know, I run a professional investment firm. So I wouldn't say there's one thing because uh, we actually do have to apply our experience and our analytical foresight into deciding investment. Like many other investors, we constantly have a lot of more projects. Well, you know, if, if you've learned a lot about venture capital, it is a relationship business. So we established what we call a filter, uh, which we have people to refer quality people and deals to us. So that's the first thing. And we met Sarah through one of our investors in Pakistan. Uh, second, you know, we we bet on a mic macro market, you know, and the market proposition that Sarah presented is very compelling. And third, of course, the quality of entrepreneur is really important to us. But that is a very difficult <clears throat> way of describing certainly the intelligence there, the drivers there, uh, her ability to put together a team. Uh, all the normal check uh, boxes that she meets that and, and she articulates very well. Uh, you know, entrepreneur has a very challenging task. Uh, we only met her a very short period of time. We have to quickly assess versus other people who may have known her a lifetime. I echo what MC talked about earlier. Uh, you want to back a horse that can run. You don't want to back a horse. You have to tell it how to run. So, what we're looking for is someone who's really brilliant and, and hard charging, high energy, maybe needs a little help on the side, but doesn't need us to tell her what to do. And that's how she struck me. And then right away I knew we want to back someone who got their head very balanced. So yeah, the rest of it is in the memo. <laughs> Thank you, Tav. That was really interesting. Um, so, Saira, um, also just to talk a little about V-Rays, what was one key learning that you realized you were missing in your journey when you came into the program and you were helped through the V-Rays program, which expedited your investment journey? Well, uh, it's difficult to focus on one key learning, but I definitely have two learnings, which I would like to share with you. Uh, I was already getting prepared for the investment, uh, but definitely I needed the final touch or the push from the from the experts who have been doing it for a long time. And uh, I think one of the key learning which I learned uh, was that time is never your friend. Time is never a friend of entrepreneur, so you're always short of time. First of all, so when I started this investment raise, uh, I wasn't getting uh, traction from VCs because you know the VCs are always going for the hot thing. And the hot thing in Pakistan at that time was a quick commerce, you know, last mile delivery, 10 minutes delivery, while it was filling in the other areas in the many other countries in the world. So uh, when I was trying to bring in the VCs, my deal with the other people, other people who were already interested in me and who had shown their faith and interest in, and trust in me was getting cold. So at that time, um, Maria and uh, Mavish uh, told me that it's time to close. So close, move ahead. VCs will come themselves and they'll see the traction and the numbers and this is exactly what happened. The moment they said that they're closing the round, we started getting uh, you know, calls from everywhere. I received at least 20, 22 calls from uh, major VCs and I was super surprised that they were waiting for me to close the round and now those investors are coming in for the seed stage. So I guess you have, it's about taking the decision uh, on time and making sure that you do it at the right time. And secondly, important thing is that fundraising is a, is a full-time job. So you need to have your team in place who is running the show because ultimately the investor is going to ask you about the numbers, about the traction, not about how much you raised. So people always confuse fundraising as you know the end point. It's not, it's the starting point. So when I was busy raising the funds, my team was working in getting the traction and make sure that the numbers never drop and they in fact go 30% month on month. So these two things, the time is never your friend and build up your team who is taking your mission forward while you are uh, you know, raising the fund. And I think the third thing is, uh, which I learned was, you have to be on the driving seat. No one can do the journey for you. They can 
tell me what to do. We can guide you, but it's ultimately your journey. You have to do it yourself. So please drive the journey yourself. And to all the ladies who out there and the women who out there who want to raise investment, please take charge of your investment process and, and lead it in a way that you make it successful. And you can do it. I know that sure, for sure you can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And building on to this, I think uh, we would also love to know how, you know, you were, you reached out to Seraph and, you know, how VRAS helped you facilitate that process. Well, uh, as Maria also said, and Mavish also said, that they actually start with the process of investor mapping, right? So it's, it's, it's it, though it apparently seems like a very big industry, the VC industry, the angel industry, it's actually not. Even you can easily, the information spreads across the borders, it spreads across different countries and the cities. So uh, we initially started off together with uh, Maria and Mavish uh, compiling the list of investors and getting the network, uh, networking with investors. And during that process, uh, one of, as uh, I've also mentioned, that you know, knowing the person is very important because you're betting on someone. So getting a reference is a very important thing. So make sure that you have the right references in place. And luckily, I had a reference in place who was connected to TAF. Obviously, they had to do the due diligence and everything. But that connection acted as the reference point and from there, the communication further started. And they went into the details of the due diligence and all this. So uh, map your, mapping the investors uh, is exactly what uh, he has helped me with. Then um, structuring the deal, making the networks and the connections work and be ready for the due diligence in a professional way rather than in a haphazard way where your documents are spread all across uh, everywhere and yet they're not compiled in a VDR. So we were ready for the investment when we reached out to the investors. Uh, thank you. I think that consolidates a lot of learning in one answer and I feel like a lot of uh, founders would benefit from that. Um, so thanks, Tyra. Moving on to Tuff again. Um, Tough, you've invested in several, several women-led companies globally. And, you know, globally women-led companies struggle to raise with less than 3% funding in women-led startups. What would you share with stakeholders about women, uh, about investing in women-led companies or startups that are led by women? Well, I happen to have the fortune to invest in a, a number of women that have been very successful, including now the global head of the Y Combinator Healthcare partner. Um, and I think, you know, it, it comes down to the investor himself. It really isn't about an entrepreneur. The investor bias and how they were brought up, how they were culturally, you know, constructed affected how they make decisions. I happen to be one of the, you know, uh, venture capitalists doesn't really look at entrepreneur as a woman and man, but I listen to what they say and there are generally two things I'm looking for. One, if, if you are not a great presenter because you're a first-time entrepreneur, then I look for data. All you need to show me is what you've done. And I will be wild by that and say, okay, this is something we can back. We can always have, find someone to help her. If you're a great communicator in energy, then I have to understand what are you working on? Is this industry, you know, uh, right, is the right business for the industry? It really, you know, uh, if I have any advice for women entrepreneurs, go find the people who have the track record backing women and don't waste time trying to convince people who have bias backing women. That is just not a great use of your time. And there are a lot of investors that will, you know, that will not have an issue backing women or having the bias. In fact, I don't know about Pakistan, but I know in the United States, there are a number of funds that specifically back women entrepreneurs. There are a number of angels who are specifically back women entrepreneurs. Many of us realize that this is the underinvested group of people. And so I would say, you know, just stick with exactly what the business requires. Understanding the business, learn, Saya said it better than we, better than I did. You know, she, you know, she, had, she was step-by-step step, a month ago understanding fundraising is a full-time job. Fundraising is finding a partner. It's no different than getting married. You take marriage very seriously, you take fundraising seriously because these are your partner you're going to grow with. So that's what I can offer you. 
I think that's a wonderful answer, Duff. And before I ask you my next question, I know that there are a lot of uh, founders, entrepreneurs, as, as well as partners in, um, you know, joining us today. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in the chat. In a while, we're going to address those as well. Um, so Duff, you know, uh, I, I think that, that's a brilliant answer, uh, you know, on how stakeholders should approach this. Uh, building on this, I would also love to know that as an investor, what do you watch out for while making a deal? Um, and what, what is it that you recommend that startups can do to increase their chances of raising investment? Okay. <clears throat> well, I'll answer the second question first. Really do your homework. You have one chance to talk to an investor, particularly professional investor like us, who make a living by listening to pitches and understanding how you talk about a business. We've done this for 20, 30 years. Within five minutes, we get a very good sense of whether you've done your homework or not. Now, nobody would know everything about the industry, but certainly you need to know more than I do. Okay, so when you walk in telling me about, in one sentence, I'm creating an app to connect the Pakistan healthcare dots together. This is how people in Pakistan search healthcare. That got my attention because I know it's different in the United States. And I know Pakistan has 200 plus, more 300 million people. And to me, that is a very, very important one or two sentence pitch. So do your homework. Now, very few industry that has no player in there, but you have to stand out and say, what is it that you do that different? I look for four things when people pitch me. First, tell me what you do. Oh, interesting. Second, what have you done? Third, how much money you're raising and why? Fourth, what the company look like two years from now, right? That's a sequence I personally use, maybe differently out of venture capitalists. I don't really need to know your background. I don't need to read your bio. In fact, I don't care about your bio until you tell me the story. I can tell how good you are by how you communicate your story and how you put things together. The second part is really important. What have you done? And I can tell within six month period, the difference between one group, the other group based on your productivity. And so when you go pitch an investor, I would say the first thing, do your homework. Second, really show what you've done. Um, and that really uh, is what I think the golden rule. And, and you can, the rest you can't help because whether someone's interested in your sector or not, that's really not your issue. I think that's, uh... A brilliant answer to this question and I feel like um, it also gives us so much food of thought for you know uh, ensuring that our entrepreneurs are investment ready and have these qualities when they come and pitch to in investors. Mavish, do you want to add to this? Yeah, no, I just wanted to, uh, like both, I think the points that were raised by Tuff and Dr. Sarah were so important. Uh, we, It's interesting to see like a lot of the times uh, people do, and it is intimidating a process. People get very intimidated by the fundraising process, and when they're when they're signing up for for the journey, they're they're not aware of how much uh, tenacity and resilience it takes to actually get through. Um, and so, I think for people who are, the first question we we ask everyone as they're joining the program is like are you sure you need to raise funds? And are you sure you need to sign up for this? Uh, because it's it's not something, it's not a walk in the park at all, right? And when you're, and the one of the things that we look for is how committed uh, founders are to the fundraising journey, right? Because they're not just making a, a commitment to their investor today, they're making to the, the a commitment to the investor tomorrow and the day after, right? So it's not just about the current round you're raising, but the entire journey and the strategy that you're building for your investors today, for tomorrow. Uh, people are giving you their money and it's, it's a very serious responsibility to take on. So it's really important for you to know exactly what you're gonna do with it and be able to explain to the person who's making that bet on you, that how are you going to best utilize that money and get them the returns and, and the scale and, and, and whatever it is that they are looking, hoping to see with that, uh, how are you going to achieve it? And why are you the right person for it? Uh, Tough mentioned something that I think is that we 
sometimes find a little bit missing in, in the ecosystem here is the importance of data, right? I think people really need to dig in and present insights as to how they've gotten to the point where they've gotten to and how are they going to make that next journey over the next two years, three years. Um, and those that that is a very critical way of sort of getting the buy-in from an investor um, is telling your story through data. When you're not able to do that, then it kind of is not, it's not a very good reflection of how deeply you've understood the problem that you're trying to solve for and the solution you're building for. Thank you so much, Mavesh. Um, so tough one last question before we go towards the audience questions. And I think um, it's more towards, you know, uh, how you see the ecosystem growing. So what would you think it, uh, you know, it takes for companies in regions like MENA and Pakistan to scale globally, considering your experience with emerging markets and then also seeing uh, companies in well-developed markets? Well, you know, I can't comment on Pakistan's environment, and I'm, I'm the last person that can tell you what the funding environment is. <clears throat> and I'm certainly hope, you know, there are investors that back women entrepreneurs. Um, at, at least where I'm sitting at in the United States, we don't really have a geographic bias, but we do have geographic caution, right? Understanding where we go into and whether, you know, at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm responsible. I'm just like, you know, uh, Dr. Siddiq, I'm responsible for my investors. I need to generate return for them. And, and then Dr. Siddiq generally generate return for my investment. So um, I think just uh, the world is very transparent these days. You know, you're one phone call, one Zoom call away from investors all over the world. And I think continue to do what, you know, what WeRaise is doing. WeRaise is a great, great advocate for the country. And I think, I hope that people will support what this in there because getting a voice in the industry is really important. The funding market is not fair. There's no such thing as fairness in the venture capital business. Okay. You have to fight for it. You got to go out. You got to do your work. You got to network. Not all of us are born equal. Not all of us went to Stanford, which we walked next door. There's 50 venture capitalists. So just keep trying, raise your profile. This is how the community works. Raise your profile in this, information intensive stages there is no shortcut you just have to keep your presence let everybody know what you've done and over 10 15 years you will see the fruit of success for the re-raise and many women entrepreneurs from pakistan and i'm looking forward to see the next deal thank you Duff. um so i'm going to take the audience questions i have a few in my chat um so i think mostly uh, the questions are for Sarah and Duff. And so we can take, I think, four questions for now. Um, Saira, the first question is for you. At what point did you start your fundraising journey? And did you build a proof of concept and took it off for a spin and got some traction before raising funds? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very valid question. Actually, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the startups in Pakistan try to raise funds when they have not even tried the MVP. Uh, you know, investors, when they are investing in you, they want to see whether the product is a good market fit or not. So I started raising funds after we had a, a good traction from the market and after, you know, um, making sure that the product is actually in line with, the, with what the market requires. So I did a lot of bootstrapping initially. And once after the bootstrapping, once the ground was stable, we had sufficient data as stuff also said that you have to show through your numbers that you will be able to deliver something meaningful in the coming days, or you're already building on something which will be a big company later on. So once we have started having the data, the traction, and um, something which could be shown to the world that this product is good, then we started raising, planning for the fundraise. So I would suggest to everyone that please, you know, instead of straight away looking for funding, do some homework, use some friends and family members' uh, money from them and put in your own money because if you're not believing, believing in yourself, who else is gonna believe in you? And once the numbers are there, then go for the fundraise. Need, depending on your requirement as well. It's not like, you know, it's something which, you, which is good to have. It is something which is 
only needed if you require money to expand and scale up. Thanks, Saira. Um, Tuff, the next question is for you. So it's, it's basically um, a two tier question. Um, what is one aha moment where you're like, okay, this is great. I'm in, I'm putting my money in this startup. And what is one deal breaker where you're just going to be like, you know, I'm not investing in this startup? <laughs> oh my God, all these one questions put me on the spot here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I, uh, let me answer the later question. One deal breaker is honesty. If I find somewhat of a, you know, a difference in facts or I don't have confidence this person has integrity in terms of telling the truth, uh, I walk pretty quickly. And you do find that. Some of them are benign lies, some of them are not. Okay. Um, I'm okay with an entrepreneur to exaggerate a little bit about their ability, but I'm not okay when there's a fact that entrepreneur lie about. Okay, there's a difference between being a salesperson versus having a character issue. Character issues you can't cure. That's something that is, you know, I learned from 30 years, you just walk away. Now, the first question is what's one thing I look for? Um, at what point, it's a, it's a synthesis. For me, personally, just I'm speaking from a, it's a synthesis. I have a few things in my mind I'm attracting an entrepreneur. As I go through the due diligence, it all comes together. Um, I think the picture has to mix well. If this person is great technical capability, but I don't know her leadership capability, but when I see for a team <clears throat> that they have great leader opportunities, so I'm looking for you know, uh, complementary skills. One of the hardest things to do is whether this person can scale or not. You know, there's no way you will know that at the beginning. Um, so we really used to have a leap of faith. And I just observed the entrepreneur. I gave a said, you know, I think she or he can scale. So again, answer the question. There's no one thing. It's a process synthesis. And we have to synthesize in 30, 40 days and where someone has to know the person for a long time. And that's, a, that's kind of the value that we build over the years. And experience does count. And I think for those investors starting off investing, it does take time to create a synthesis ability to be able to put the picture together. Um, so again, sorry, I didn't answer the one thing that I make it go. It, it's, a, it's a number of things. I know. I think that absolutely makes sense. It's, it's a process and you can't just sum it up. Um, uh, so thank you for answering that, Duff. I think um, integrity is something we also emphasize on while working with our uh, founders, because I think that and their passion to build the business comes first and foremost. Uh, Saira, the next question is again for you. What are your key metrics and KPIs that you track and report both internally and to investors? Um, you know, in, in our business, which is about, uh, it's like a marketplace at the, at the same time, it's a tech play as well. So what we try to do is obviously, um, we have our financial KPIs, which are very important because if you don't track your finances, then you don't know where you're going. So financial KPIs, including you know, the, the number of orders, the transaction size, the different revenue streams is something we track. Secondly, we do track our customer uptake at, uh, KPIs. Uh, so where are the customers coming from? Uh, the demographic of the customers, how can we retain them? What are, what are is like the, uh, the customer acquisition cost? So customer uptake data, and then we have health service provider uh, data, which is also tracked that how many health service providers which we have onboarded, how many of them are being retained with us, how many are actually getting the consultations. So for me, three, uh, three set of KPIs are important, financial, customer uptake, and the health service providers. And Saira, Mesh, the next question is for you. So as uh, a VRA's coach and witnessing MedIQ's journey, um, what is it that you would encourage other entrepreneurs to do to become investment ready? Yeah, that's a great question. I think everybody uh, touched upon it a little bit, but I think uh, doing your homework is the number one thing and being in the driver's seat. So I think a lot of the times uh, when we engage with different entrepreneurs and we're deciding whether uh, a founders are ready for the program or not, we're looking at um, 
it, it, of course, we're looking at coachability and that includes the fact that how much of the planning have they done? What is their understanding of the market, right? So a lot of the times we say, we look at the big investors that are in Pakistan and we say, oh, okay, I want money from this guy and this guy and this, 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 this uh, investor without really thinking through like, what is their investment thesis? What does their current existing portfolio look like? What makes you think that they would put money into your company? These are all things that go into the planning aspect of it. And then of course, building those relationships. So a lot of the times, like even having worked on your blurb, like when you're reaching out to someone, A, ideally you should be reaching out to someone through a reference, the way Saira and uh, Dr. Saira and Tuff connected, because there's no, there's no, there's nothing can replace a warm connection. But even for cold emails, like your, your blurb has to be super catchy and you really need to think through like, okay, if someone were, were to ask me for my money, what would I want to see from them? I think that really helps. Like, and and most 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 of the times, you know, entrepreneurs don't have all this extra money to spare. So really think hard. Like, if someone was asking you for a million dollars, what would you want to be seeing, uh, and what would you want the um, entrepreneur like the kind of homework they should have done? Uh, so being prepared and and doing the homework in advance and having a clear understanding of where you are going to deploy that capital before even going into that journey is super important. Thanks, Mevesh. Uh, Saira, uh, this is the last question. I think it's two questions where I feel like, you know, a lot of people will want to know. Um, but coming from a technical background and as a health expert, how did you manage and secure uh, business acumen? And also, how did you build your team and figured out which human resource you require for MedIQ. Um, right, uh, I think uh, the first thing, the first question I'll take it first. So yeah, being a technical person, I think it was something which, which actually helped me out because you have to be a subject matter expert. If you don't know your subject, nobody else can teach it to you. You can learn other skills. So I learned my management skills through my experience of managing the biggest health insurance program of Pakistan. I learned my team management skills during my work with different uh, multilateral donor, donor agencies, with private sector hospitals and all this. So uh, subject matter expertise uh, gave me uh, uh, you know, something which uh, I built upon, the skills I learned during my experience and uh, the management of the business acumen uh, I think was there right from the beginning. When I started my career, I just had to polish it up more. So I never actually practiced as a doctor. I, I'm a trained health economist and a public health professional. And um, I have been running big, huge programs uh, and have to make them successful in order to, to make them sustainable. So uh, it, it, I polished it over time through my experience and my learning and the environmental conditions. Uh, the second question was, how do you choose your team? I think it all depends on, team is the key. Even before, you know, putting, um, when the paper, when this idea was on paper, we already decided upon who will be the main players in this uh, startup with me. Who will be looking after the operation? Who will be looking after tech? Who will be looking after finance? Who will be looking after the legal side? Who will be looking after the marketing and uh, growth side? So the team was already decided before we actually start implementing this thing. So look for your team member. If you don't have a co-founder, in my case, there was no, no co-founder. So I am dependent on the team and the team is my strength. So the strength has to be chosen before you actually start implementing. So these are uh, some of the key positions which you have to be make, to make sure that they choose them wisely and uh, with a lot of, um, and, and with synergies as well, because it's about people following your passion and your dream. Do they think alike or not? So there are multiple things which make a successful team. And you have to be very careful. The initial five or 10 employees of the company should be very carefully chosen. Uh, and the alignment should be there from the beginning. Um, wonderful answer. Thank you, Saira. Um, so I think with this, we are just right in time for wrapping up the webinar. Um, I'm really grateful for everybody who joined the webinar and, you know, took out time to listen in. I know it's 5.43 p.m. in Pakistan, which means almost evening on a work day. Um, so really appreciate that you join and I hope that, you know, everybody has benefited from this. Um, 
specifically, uh, you know, um, some of the ecosystem partners have joined today to show support. Really grateful for all of you. Um, I also want to thank you, Duff. I know it's early in the morning where you are and um, for taking time out today and speak to, you know, our audience. Really grateful for your time. Mevish, Saira, obviously, and uh, Maria, who had to drop off because she had a flight. Um, do you, Duff, do you want to share uh, a few, you know, one last message before we sign off? Well, I just want to tell you how much uh, um, I'm honored to be here to share uh, a little bit I learned of venture capital with all of you. <clears throat> this is my first time to connect with a Pakistan, uh, the people, the entrepreneurs. So I'm looking forward to many years to come. And when the COVID restriction is, you know, lifted, um, at some point, hopefully later this year, next year, I'm coming to visit. So hopefully we can connect again and continue with re raises take advantage of the time when I'm coming down and meet some more uh, amazing entrepreneur. And uh, good luck to all of you and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Duff, for joining us and um, for sharing such insightful learnings with our participants as well. Um, so I think with this, we wrap this up. The uh, I think the live video would be on Facebook. We would, for those of you who couldn't join us earlier and missed a few of you know parts of conversation, you can always see the recorded live version on Facebook. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Saira, Mevesh, and Taf, um, for all your time and for everything that you shared with the participants. Bye bye. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Take care. So bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Taf. Thank you, Mevesh. Bye. And all the bye. families.